Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar. It's entitled, Probing Exosomes Using a Novel Affinity-Based Proteomic Technology. Exosomes were once considered cellular garbage bags. Now these lipid nanovesicles are being explored for a number of applications, including their use as drug delivery vehicles and as research tools. Today's webinar will show you how exosomes are now being moved into the clinical diagnostics arena by a new affinity-based proteomic technology. You'll also learn how research teams are applying this technique to answer disease-specific proteomic questions in a high-throughput environment. I'm John Sterling, Editor-in-Chief of GEN, and I'm going to serve as the moderator. Please feel free to enlarge the webinar slide images. At any time during the webinar, you can send in a question for our panelists. Type your question into the Ask a Question box on the left-hand side of your computer and then hit Submit. The panel will try to answer as many as possible during the question and answer segment that takes place after all the presentations have been made. I'd now like to turn the proceedings over to our first webinar presenter, Dr. Stephen Williams. He's Chief Medical Officer at Somalogic. Stephen will also introduce our second webinar panelist. Stephen, the floor is all yours. Thank you, John. Hello, everybody. Um, as John said, my name is Stephen Williams, and I'm Chief Medical Officer of Somalogic. What I'm going to do is to give you a brief overview of the technology um, that Alad Clayton used on microsomes, and then I'll hand over to Alad to tell you, uh, he'll tell you about his research. So proteomics is a very exciting field, but, it, but it's been, until today, it's been limited by technology challenges. The problem has been that if you want to measure a large number of proteins to find new biology, you've had to make a trade. Either you can measure a large number of abundant proteins with shotgun mass spec or gels, or a small number of low abundance proteins, but the problem has been you can't do both at the same time. And if you really want to characterize biological patterns, that's the demand you're making of the technology. And I think this is the reason that, that proteomics has been eclipsed by genomics so far rather unfairly. What Somalogic has done is to at least partly overcome this problem. And the way that's been done is to, to generate a new class of affinity reagents that we call somomers, which are slow, off-rate, modified aptomers. Now, an aptomer is a piece of DNA or RNA, and it has charge, and it has shape, and so they will bind to proteins. And initially, the thermologic tried to use naked aptomers, unmodified DNA, but we ran into the problem that they weren't specific enough and the, the binding characteristics weren't good enough to overcome this problem of, of abundance where some proteins are eight logs more abundant than others. What you're looking at on the right-hand side of this picture is a modified aptomer, a somomer, which is the detailed structure at the bottom, binding to a protein. And this is a real electron density map of a protein from an X-ray crystal structure. And what you'll see in that um, binding uh, picture is that there are shaded areas, there are structures sticking off the somomer which are colored red. Those represent modified uh, parts of the DNA. And what we've done is to incorporate hydrophobic side chains into the DNA. And as you'll see in this diagram, they actually stick out and are responsible for a lot of the interaction between the somomer and the protein. And that's why they, they change the binding characteristics dramatically. The other thing they do is to stick inwards into the structure of the somomer and enable it to make shapes that a coil of DNA or RNA couldn't make. So what they really did for us was to increase the shape and charge diversity of these molecules so that we could find ones that had better binding characteristics and slow off rates. And what we've done is put 1,129 of these reagents together in an assay that we call SOMASCAN that measures that number of proteins simultaneously from a single sample. When you're looking for a, a new biology, you want to be confident that you'll find it from whichever origin uh, it, it comes from. And on the left-hand side of this diagram, you can see that uh, of the proteins on the menu, the 1,129 menu, they're distributed across 
different origins, and you'll hear about an even a, a different one that's not included on the pie chart today, the microsome uh, compartment. And on the right, you'll, you'll, the other thing you want to know is that the uh, important biological processes that you're interested in are, are going to be represented in, in the menu, and indeed this, this menu that we have on SOMASCAN covers all of those important processes. This diagram shows the principle of how the assay works. I'm not going to go into great detail, but I'll tell you about the important components uh, that enable the assay to work. So in the top left-hand corner, you start with a sample of N proteins represented by the pink blob. In a, in a particular sample, there might be 5,000 of them or so. And what we do is do we put those samples into 96 well plates. And within the 96 well plates, we move to the middle of the diagram and we let our reagents combine with the proteins. There are actually two immobilization steps as part of this assay, all done in the 96 well plates. The first immobilization step enables us to wash away all of the proteins that did not bind to a somomer. And the second immobilization step enables us to wash away all the somomers which bound to um, the wrong protein transiently, non-specifically, and then fell off because the off rate is short, or some of them that didn't find a protein at all. So at the end of the assay, what we're left with is small n, a fraction of big N, a number of somomers. And the number of each type of somomer is a constant fraction of the number of protein molecules per unit volume there were in the original sample. So what we've done is we've turned a protein molecule counting problem that we started with on the left into a DNA molecule counting problem at the end, which is easy on the right. Um, and so I'll tell you a bit more about how we count the DNA molecules. What we do is to preprint an Agilent slide with each of the complementary sequences of our probes um, so that each spot on this Agilent slide uh, represents the physical position of that spot tells you the identity of the sequence of our reagent, and the identity of the sequence of our reagent tells us the identity of the protein that it was designed to bind to. So that's what the position of the spot tells you. The fluorescence intensity of each spot tells you how many molecules bound in that position, and we actually average 10 of those for each individual reagent over the surface of the slide to get better statistics. So at the bottom of this picture, you see you can relate fluorescence to protein concentration in the original sample using a standard curve like this one. And we have 1,129 of those standard curves, one for each of our reagents. So this slide shows you the characteristics of the assay. Um, as you'll see, there's no one characteristic here which is unique, that there are other techniques that have CVs of 5%, for example, you can get that out of an immunoassay. And there are other techniques that you can measure thousands of proteins. You can get that out of a gel or mass spec. But this combination of attributes enables you to interrogate the low abundance proteome at high throughput using small volumes of samples with very precise coefficients of variation. That's the unique combination of features that enables you to do things in proteomics that you couldn't do before. And we've had quite a lot of experience using this assay. As you'll see in the center of this slide, 60,000 samples and over 400 studies. And around the, uh, the satellite uh, blocks around the outside show you the examples of some of the fields of interest that people have applied the SOMASCAN assay in. The key point here is that this assay is successful over 90% of the time in finding new biologic signals or improving upon the old ones. So you can be confident when you, when you use it that you are going to find something useful. Finally, I wanted to bring you into where the vision of this technology is, and that's basically that we, we want it to become rather like the iPhone, which you might see represented in the center, that there are going to be capabilities uh, on it that we can discover 
um, maybe somologic discover some, uh, that represent key biological processes from small amounts of sample. But the key here is that researchers around the world, people like yourselves, will discover new apps for the phone and we can incorporate them as time goes on and we can use that information to improve knowledge of biology and pharmacology and health. So now I'm going to hand over to Alad Clayton, who is a senior lecturer at the Institute of Cancer and Genetics at Cardiff University School of Medicine. And the focus of his research has been on exosomes, and so he's going to tell you all about what he's done with SomaScan. Remember, for those of you who've just joined, if you, if you want to ask a question, we're going to answer those at the end. Um, and so just please type your question into the box on your screen. So, Alad, over to you. Thank you, Stephen, for the uh, lovely introduction and the very eloquent explanation of our complex technology. So we had um, a collaboration with Somalogic um, quite recently, um, exploring the potential use of that technology, which you just heard about, um, in probing the proteome of exosome vesicles. Um, I'm aware that perhaps many of the audience are not necessarily familiar with vesicles, so forgive my few introductory slides here. So exosomes are very, very small membrane-bounded lipid vesicle structures. And these are manufactured within the late endocytic tract of cells. And probably most cells, if not all cell types, will make exosomes to some extent. This compartment um, has a membrane which can bud spontaneously and pinch off to form hundreds of free-floating vesicles within this late endosomal compartment. Um, some of this cargo may be trafficked to other parts of the cell, like the lysosome, for example, where the cargo is degraded. Alternatively, the compartment might be trafficked to the plasma membrane, where upon fusion, these preformed vesicles are secreted actively into the extracellular space. Now, cells make um, perhaps many different types of vesicle-like structures. You may see in the literature terms like microvesicles being used. To my mind, microvesicles are relatively larger structures which form form from direct outward budding of the plasma membrane. So these are slightly different types of vesicles which cells make. In general, the smaller vesicles tend to be predominant in terms of number. And there are also these um, slightly odd structures called exosome-like vesicles, which may be derived from direct outward budding of the plasma membrane, but to a smaller extent. Um, which pathway is predominantly responsible for exosome secretion is something that is hotly debated in the field. But in general, most of us favor the endocytic route of exosome manufacture and biogenesis, simply because there's more evidence for it. So on these um, electron micrographs, um, I'm trying to depict these structures happening in reality. So on the left panel there, I'm showing the structure of these multivesicular bodies or multivesicular endosomes fusing directly with the plasma membrane, expelling tens of these discrete vesicular structures into the intercellular space. On the right, we see identical things present, um, cells in vivo, so that's from a, a lymph node section, for example. But these sections have been stained with immunogold conjugated antibodies. And if you look where that intensely dark black spot actually is, you'll see on the plasma membrane of the adjacent cell, there's very little staining present. And in fact, even on the limiting membrane of the endosome, which gives rise to these vesicles, there's still actually quite scant staining. The staining is absolutely focused to these discrete small vesicular structures. So clearly, the process of exosome biogenesis goes hand in hand with grabbing certain molecules, which includes protein and RNA and lipid-like molecules, pumping these actively into the vesicle structure for their, for their secretion and release into the space outside cells where they do their functions. So this idea of enriching proteins or other molecules into the vesicles is really important. So this very complicated slide, 
I'm trying to summarize what we know about exosomes in cancer. I think cancer is the most developed field, really, in the exosome um, research arena. But increasingly, other pathological conditions are catching up, including neurosciences and cardiovascular disease. So let's just explore cancer for a brief moment. So my panel number one, um, we know that exosomes released by cancer cells can directly interact with cells of the immune system, particularly natural killer cells and T lymphocytes, and can interfere with their correct function. We see diminished cytokine release, diminished capacity to kill target cells, and also exosomes can activate a population of CD4 positive T cells, forcing these to differentiate into regulatory T cells, which in turn suppress other T cell functions. Exosomes are also known to interfere with monocytic cell differentiation. So instead of getting an antigen-presenting cell, instead you're getting a suppressive cell, which again can impede correct immune function. In panel number three, um, this describes some of the more recent work from the group, where we found that exosomes can activate um, normal cells in the tumor microenvironment, be they fibroblasts, or stem cells of bone marrow origin, for example, to become um, aggressive tumor-promoting myofibroblastic cells, which secrete heightened levels of growth factors such as VGF, for example. And the photograph number four shows this quite nicely. We have a monolayer of exosome-generated myofibroblasts, and on top of those we put endothelial cells. And these endothelial cells will proliferate, migrate, and organize themselves into vessel-like structures. Exosomes can directly interact with endothelial cells and again encourage the formation of blood vessels. Exosomes can escape the microenvironment and work more distantly, um, for example, activating lymph nodes um, to receive metastatic cells. They can make blood, cells, blood vessels sorry, in the lung more permeable, and they can mobilize progenitors from bone marrow which again can contribute towards the process of disease spreading. We know that certain chemotherapeutic agents get into cells and they are packaged into vesicles and expelled. So it's a mechanism for drug resistance. And also some naturally occurring anti-tumor antibodies or indeed therapeutic antibodies can bind exosomes and they get sequestered essentially. So these antibodies are not as effective as they might otherwise be. So there's a whole assortment of mechanisms here where exosomes play, if not a critical role, they play certainly a huge contributing role to disease progression. And my next slide is a silly analogy to summarize this. So if you imagine exosomes as a representative of the parent cell, albeit smaller and rather simpler, they certainly share many of the functional and phenotypic characteristics of that parent cell and may help the tumors um, in their quest for world domination, if you like. However, I must add here that although I've presented exosomes as a bad thing, we know exosomes exist in healthy people. We don't understand very well their roles in homeostasis and in healthy functions. So there may be good exosomes as well as bad exosomes to consider here. So, um, applying our exosome vesicles to the somalagic platform was something of real interest to us. And if you imagine adding a cocktail of somomers, which Steve spoke about, to this vesicular structures, it's quite likely that some of these vesicles might be able to bind to proteins which are obviously available for them to interact with, such as those on the surface. However, there might be others which are simply not able to penetrate that membrane structure, may not reach those proteins which are protected within the lumen of the vesicle. So we had to think of um, applying the sample to that technology in a, in a perhaps non-standard way and think of options for perhaps libera liberating those inaccessible proteins um, so the summer must combine them. So this is a pilot experiment that we did with the team at Somalogic. So the horizontal heat map there shows um, a range of buffer conditions that we used in this pilot. The standard one there is labeled SB17, and it's a HEPIS buffered salt solution, and that's the standard condition which the assay works on. But to that buffer, we added different detergents and other factors, other reagents, 
to see whether we could get um, more identifications, essentially. And this was done with a simpler um, version of the array, reading off only 300 proteins in this case. And you can see, indeed, for some of the analytes read by the array, the addition of detergents like NP40 um, gave us a stronger signal. But however, conversely, at the other end and the bottom left panel there, the detergents would interfere perhaps with the detection of other analytes in the assay. So I think playing about with different lytic conditions is something that could be further optimized um, in future studies. Um, and you should bear in mind that doing so could both enhance signal and also inhibit um, the signal that the assay gives out. So I was very, very keen to send the best possible sample I could make to Somalogic for analysis. Making very pure exosomes is actually quite a task. Um, to do this, we use a very old-fashioned method, but it's still considered by many as the gold standard way of preparing exosomes. So we simply took a very concentrated, dirty vesicle prep based purely on, on palleting at high speed, and this cloudy, milky solution shown there in that photograph was overlaid on a gradient of sucrose. The tube was spun then very, very hard overnight, um, and the vesicles moved down the tube. They don't pellet. They're prevented from pelleting because they reach a point of equilibrium along the density here. That density was classically reported by Graf Raposo and her colleagues in Institute Curie some years ago as to be between 1.1 and 1.2 grams per mil, and that's classical for exosomes. So in figure 1A there, we analyzed each fraction collected from the gradients for the presence of nanoparticles using the nanoside platform. And we see very clearly a peak there, fraction 8, 9, and 10, where we had the greatest number of nanoparticles. These were small things that were generally less than 200 nanometers in diameter. The mode of the peak there was around 130. And again, we analyzed each fraction for molecular markers that we expect to be present on exosomes. So we had sticky latex beads. We coated those with exosomes and stained them for some classical markers, including the tetraspanin, CD9, 81, 63, MIT class 1. And as these were prostate cancer-derived cell exosomes, we also stained for prostate-specific membrane antigen. And again, we see a peak for these markers at the same place in fractions A9 and 10. So these fractions were pooled and essentially shipped off to Somalogic for analysis by the SOMASCAN assay. So this is the result of that ex experiment. So we ran um, the exosomes were examined in triplicates under both a standard SB17 condition, and we chose one of those other conditions that I showed earlier, the one that gave us reasonable levels of what we thought was exosome lysis. And for many of those uh, analytes, the lysis reported with higher fluorescence values compared to the standard solution. <clears throat> but for many of them, the lysis conditions, in fact, impeded signal. So we decided to um, go with two lists for further analysis, in essence. So one of the questions I alluded to in my early introduction slide was which proteins might be specifically grabbed by the cell and put into exosomes. Um, those which are enriched in the vesicles, therefore, relative to cells. Something of real interest to us. It gives us clues about how exosomes are made, and it gives us clues about how they might function in the extracellular environment. So we simply compared, therefore, using the SOMASCAN assay, exosomes versus their parent cells. I'm showing you here um, a range of situations. So panel D um, is highlighting in the dark red bars the proteins which are relatively enriched in the cells compared to the exosomes. And that includes an example, Galactin-8 there. There were a small number of proteins which were present at approximately equal levels, such as amyloid precursor protein in both cells and exosomes. But the really interesting ones for us really were those that were clearly enriched in the exosome compartment. One of these was MFGE8. This is a, a classical exosome-associated protein, a very interesting protein which combined to the exposed phosphatidylserine um, on the outer leaflet of the vesicle. And the other end of that molecule has an integrin binding domain. So this molecule is known to participate in the phagocytic uptake of apoptotic blebs, for example. 
but we've known for years that MFG8 is a particular feature of these small um, exosomal vesicles in addition. So to see it there was striking enrichment, was very reassuring that we've got a genuine analysis of vesicles here. And there are many other examples in this list which we simply didn't know before. The enrichment of the notch proteins, for example, um, and also the degree of enrichment of integrins. Um, sexosomal integrins is a particular interest that we've had in the past. Um, we've shown these are functional, and to see this as an enriched feature of the vesicles was, again, very reassuring. Similarly, looking at the second list using the standard conditions, we see, again, examples of analytes which were clearly preferentially present in the cells rather than the exosomes, some which are at relatively equal levels, and again, some that were enriched in the exosomes compared to cells. And I've cherry-picked some examples for you here, showing um, factors which you'd normally expect, ex expect to be secreted out of the cells, such as GCSF or VEGF, or even IL-8 and angiogenin. So these things can also be um, somehow included into the vesicle in a rather enriched manner compared to their levels in whole cells. So we have a big list of proteins here. Um, and it's very difficult to know, make decisions about which of these are we going to follow up in terms of confirmation study. For me, um, looking at those which are particularly in mission vesicles is a particular interest. However, there might be some in that list which, although they are enriched, their abundance or the actual signal given from the assay is actually very low. Um, in contrast, other people may simply be interested in proteins which are very abundant and easy to detect in the exosomes, regardless of their enrichment. So taking this information, what we simply did was multiply the two numbers together, so the fold enrichment multiplied by the log relative fluorescence output to give us a ranking list, which is shown here. So from the left going to the right, we have our rank list. So these are the proteins we would most like to follow up. And if you do that and you read from the list to see what's there, we see very high up in our ranked list is this MFGE8 molecule, which I spoke about before. There's DAF, decay accelerating factor. We have CD36, and we have some integrins. So these things are all well known to be associated with vesicles. So to see those things come up in this rank link, again, ranked list was, again, very reassuring. Similarly, with the um, standard conditions, we did the same thing, multiply the fold enrichment versus the fluorescence value to give us, again, a rank list of what we would like to follow up. And those were the funny asterisk marks there, other ones we actually um, took time out to try and validate by other methods. So one of the things I was really keen to do was to see whether the individual summers worked in binding exosomes, because we have, in essence, a complicated cocktail of a thousand or so summers in the system. And were the signals that we're generating genuine, or were they just due to some summer summer cross reactivity, if you like? So the guys in Summerlogic sent me individual summers, and I simply tested them using this very straightforward ELISA like assay, if you like. So we have immobilized, purified exosomes on a plastic plate. We block those, we add the somomers, and we detect the presence of somomers using streptavidin conjugated europium. And the readout here is time resolved fluorometry. So, those analytes that the scan said were present certainly give us positive signal on this very simple and non optimized assay. Although the signal strength in this assay was not entirely in agreement with the signal strength from the array data. But this, as I said, was not an optimized assay. It was the first time I'd had hands on these reagents, and I had only a couple of days to do this. Never, nevertheless, to see positive hits here, this gives a signal that was dependent on exosome doses, again, reassuring that these were real IDs that we were seeing. We've also done this, of course, with antibodies. Um, and here I'm showing you a panel of antibodies that were used in a similar assay, CD63 was included here as a positive control. We know that's very strong on these exosomes. And again, we see nice signal for things like CD36, ADAM9, NOT3, and tissue factor. Signal for glipicam 3 was fairly low and probably not entirely convincing positive in this example. 
Um, so we have a bit of a question mark whether Glipicam 3 is a genuine ID or not. We also ran some Westerns, of course, in order to perhaps confirm this apparent enrichment we were seeing from the Somerskin assay um, in exosomes compared to cell lysates. So we simply took equal quantity of exosome lysate to cell lysate, ran them on some Westerns and stained them. We have some controls here. Calnexin is known to be an endoplasmic reticulum resident protein, which is not well included in the exosome compartment, and certainly the Western seems to hold that true. TSG101 is a protein related to the multivesicular endosomal compartment, and again, to see nice enrichment there in the exosomes compared to cell lysate is what we would expect. So looking up that list now, we clearly have enrichment of all of these proteins and exosomes compared to cells, just as the summer scan had predicted. And the 3X, 6X, 9X, and so on there refers to the fold enrichment predicted by the summer scan assay. And clearly you can see there where we're up to 34X and above, there's no detectable band in the cell lysate, but yet we have a really thick, um, easily detected band in the exosome. So it seems to marry very well with the summer assay um, data set. This next um, slide tries to um, answer a sticky question that we had from one of the reviewers of the manuscript, which is a perfectly fair question. So we've made exosomes based on flotation, but it's quite possible that some proteins remain as contaminants in that preparation, and how confident are we that we're not measuring contaminants, we're actually measuring something related to the structure of the vesicle. So this is a variation of the sticky ELISA plate assay that I've shown you before. On this occasion, we've both captured exosomes based on an antibody, in this case CD9, and then used other antibodies against these candidate proteins, showing very clear staining here for ADAM9, NOT3, and RAC1. And again, the glipicon 3 is a little bit questionable whether it's genuinely there or not. But this assay um, is a genuine co-localization of, of CD9 together with ADAM9, for example, um, inferring, therefore, that the, uh, the new IDs are genuinely part of this vesicular structure. So how does this data set compare with published reports from others on exosomes of a similar nature? Well, we're quite lucky now in the exosome community. We have access to um, freely available databases. There's two, maybe even three available. The one I've used for this is Vesicopedia. It's curated by the Mathavian Group in Australia, and people can um, upload their data sets to this, um, and we can use it as a community resource, essentially. So in that um, database, we search for exosomes, prostate, human, and protein, and there was about 11 or so studies, and this gave us about 532 unique entries. And when we compared that data set, with our summer logic data set, we found 91 proteins were in agreement between ours and previous studies. There were 26 IDs that fell below the threshold which we considered to be positive. So these are things we might have perhaps identified um, but came up as negative in our assay but should probably have been found. Um, but Interestingly, there was nearly 400 new proteins that had not been previously found by other mass spec-based studies before. So in one simple experiment, it's a very simple experiment, we found nearly as many proteins as anybody else has in a combination of mass spec-based studies. We also did some ontology analysis of the identifications coming up from the SOMASCAN assay. We were looking for a for terms that were overrepresented in the exosomes compared to the background list. And the background list in this comparison was the entire somologic menu. And what we see here are terms that we would classically expect to see for a vesicle analysis. These include terms related to the cell membrane, GPI anchor, receptors, EGF domain, and disulfide bond. We see disulfide bond extensively in exosomes because partly they are so rich in tetraspanin proteins which have extensive disulfide networks in them. So to see these terms come up was very reassuring. Again, in the standard list, we see terms that we would expect, including alpha granules, 
Alpha granules are multivesicular body-like compartments in platelets, which is probably why that has come up. Vesicles and lumen and extracellular compartments of, the, of matrix, coagulation and complement are again known to be aspects um, which are perhaps controlled by vesicles. And also, interestingly, there was a cluster there in this network relating to the control of protease activity. Now, this wasn't a particularly known feature of exosomes at the time, but there have been studies earlier this year um, probing really the function of exosome and exosomal proteolytic regulation. So there was a nice study earlier where um, a group had interfered with exosomal tissue inhibitor of metalloprotease, um, revealing that by doing so, they made breast cancer cells more invasive with a greater propensity to metastasize. So there, there are now beginning to be studies demonstrating empirical evidence where exosomal regulation of proteolysis may actually be very important. So clearly with exosomes as a sample, the SOMA scan assay um, can reveal a host of information, some of that we expect to see, so it's reassuring, and also give us brand new information with a host of novel identifications. However, that was all done on cell line material, and of course what we really want to do is to dig into exosomes which are present in biological fluids. We've known these things are circulating in blood, they're present in urine and in other fluids, and there's an enormous interest in being able to grab these from patients and to do some really interesting biomarker studies with these vesicles. Lots of people have tried many different methods of doing this. Filtration, variants of filtration, ultrasonification, gradients, and a whole so an assortment of methods. And they all come up with two major problems. Firstly, the quantity of material you can get from these biofluids is always a challenge. But particularly for proteomics applications, the purity of the preps are really challenging. So what we've been doing over the last um, 12 months or so under a November-funded uh, international study is to try and develop methods for isolating exosomes for proteomics analysis. So we've run with a um, size exclusion column-based method, and this is fairly straightforward, and it works reasonably well. So in the top graph there, with the green brackets, um, we, we can very readily separate the vesicles from the bulk of the blood protein in this one-step system. And at the bottom, the exosomal peaks shown in blue bars there stain nicely for CD9 and other exosomal markers, while human serum albumin is separated into that latter peak. Um, over 99% of the albumin is removed. And those vesicle structures there within selected fractions depict the variable type of structures we expect to see from biofluids. So you see single vesicles, you see exotic structures, which seem to be vesicles within vesicles, and that's fairly typical. And those structures are focused to those exosome relevant fractions and are not present in the others. So when we do this method, or indeed use gradients or columns with other approaches, and we then go down to our core facility, which has a nice max, mass spectrometric facility available to us, we get some identifications. But the number of proteins ID are very limited. There are about 20 or so, and if you look at the detail of those, it's simply albumin, fibrinogen, and all the high abundant blood proteins you'd expect to see in a dirty blood-derived sample. So we're not seeing any real information of value here in terms of exosome-related identifications. So clearly, even though we've gone to the trouble of this very cumbersome column-based cleanup approach, the sample is still not good enough yet for our mass spec facility here in Cardiff, certainly. So we tried the SOMA scan assay instead with this compromised sample set, and we prepared exosomes from healthy donors from urine and also matched from their plasma. And in this case, thankfully, we're seeing hundreds of IDs, not tens. And we can clearly see proteins which come out preferentially in the urinary compartment and some preferentially in the plasma compartment. And of course, for vesicles, there might be some overlap between proteins regardless of the source. 
and just showing some very preliminary analysis of this pilot data set. Um, the first graph there shows very low fluorescence units for albumin, so clearly the color method has done a pretty good job in removing a lot of the albumin. And there's a middle panel of graphs there showing, for example, proteins which are clearly enriched in urinary exosomes compared to plasma-derived exosomes. And HEAT protein 90 was one of these, which caught my eye. HSPs are fairly ubiquitous in vesicles. So to see this one outstandingly bright in the urine compartment and not in the plasma compartment was a surprise. And when we look in the plasma exosomes, yes, of course, we have Ig. D and fibrinogen and these other contaminants that I mentioned, but we were also able to detect other um, more interesting IDs such as PSA there. And also, and even in the presence of these contaminating high abundance proteins, we're still able to detect proteins that we're interested in, such as transforming growth factor beta, and also the membrane associated ectoenzyme CD39, which has important roles in immune regulation. We're still able to see IDs like that. Clearly, we're not able to get this quality of information from mass spec um, with this compromised level of sample. So isolating exosomes from blood and urine is a major challenge, and I still don't think we're quite there yet in terms of quality of the PrEP. But regardless of the compromised quality, the SOMASCAN assay offers us a way out. It's forgiving. It is not confounded by contaminating proteins. And I think it will be a way forward to give us some very useful proteomic profiling of patient-derived vesicles in the future. So I would very much like to take time to thank my um, immediate colleagues in Cardiff University, particularly Jason Weber, who did a lot of work with confirming those IDs from the SOMASCAN assay. Timothy Stone is a very talented bioinformatician here in Cardiff who helped us with the ontology analysis. And Joanne Melton is a postdoc in the lab who's been doing a lot of the column work recently. I'd like to thank collaborators in Bilbao in Spain who've helped us with the electron microscopy work. Um, and of course, the guys at Somologic for their um, friendly and helpful collaborative approach to this project. And I look forward to working with them in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Stephen and Alan, for those superb presentations. Uh, you've really demonstrated how SOMASCAN technology can be used in exosome research, uh, in clinical diagnostics, and other applications. Uh, there's lots and lots of practical and timely advice there, so thank you. Um, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the audience for attending, but please do not go away. We're going to have a Q&A session in a moment. But before we start the Q&A, I'd like to ask you to disable your pop-up blockers. A short survey on this webinar is appearing right now or in a moment, and we'd very much appreciate your feedback on the webinar. We have a number of very interesting questions, so why don't we take the first one? Okay, so the first question we have is for Steve. Uh, First, a little kudos to you, Steve. Thanks for a great presentation on the SOMASCAN technology. I was wondering if it is possible to detect post-translational modifications or changes in tertiary structure due to amino acid substitutions. Okay, thanks. Um, so the, the short answer is that the reagents are detecting the availability of a 3D you know, shape and charge epitope. And anything that changes that shape or charge will change the binding characteristics of the reagent. Um, we, our collaborators at King's, for example, have done a lot of work on looking at um, protein quantitative trait loci, um, the association of SNPs with apparent changes in protein concentration in healthy people. And they've shown that about, they've detected so far about 100 of the proteins on the menu which are associated with SNPs. And the most likely explanation for the apparent differences in concentration there are not that the overall abundance of the protein has changed, but that the binding site has, has modified um, in the presence of a SNP. Um, and so what this is, is it's a, it's a biology discovery platform. And so as, as I've said, it, it's sensitive. These, are, these changes in apparent concentration are showing a sensitivity to changes in, this, in the epitope. Um, and our focus as a company has actually been on you know, adding more proteins to the menu rather than finding different ways of measuring the existing ones. And the reason we've done that is because this is a platform to discover 
new biology and that's been the focus. Um, and of course, if you already know that a particular modification is responsible for a piece of biology, then the discovery has been done. But having said that, um, we have made custom reagents for, uh, for some people, for some of our clients, where they need a super selective reagent that is maybe is sensitive to uh, a nearest neighbor or, or to a modification. That um, depends on having uh, both a, a stable form of both kinds of proteins that you want, the modified version or the nearest neighbor and the original protein. Um, because when we do our reagent creation process in using SELEX, what we do is we take the um, protein of interest and we incubate it with a library of 10 to the 15th random variations of modified somomers and we basically go through several rounds of enrichment where we keep the best binders and get rid of the ones that don't bind so well um, until we end up with a small number of super selective reagents. And we can do that um, when we have uh, a two closely related forms of protein. We can do that and generate very specific reagents for one form and not the other or for both. So if you have a, a, an idea for or need uh, for a, a custom reagent, then, then come talk to us because we're just starting to, um, uh, to do that for, for people on a, on a service basis. Thank you. And Steve, you have another question very closely related to that. I don't know if you want to add, add anything to it. Do you have the ability to distinguish between post-translationally modified forms of proteins or splice variants? Yeah, nothing much to add, um, although in, in general we, we think that um, phosphorylations are more likely to change the, the shape of the, um, of the binding site than um, glycosylations, which are often um, elsewhere on the protein. But yeah, the, uh, what I just said in relation to the um, kind of SELEX process, making custom reagents still applies. Well, we've thoroughly answered that question. Thank you. Alid, question for you. Exosomes serve as drug delivery vehicles that could perform better, as measured by many criteria, than liposomes have performed so far. Alid? Hi, thanks for the uh, very broad and interesting question. I think this field is um, fascinating. I believe there's a lot of um, investment now in maybe manipulating exosomes somehow as drug delivery agents. I mean, they have this fascinating property of being able to cross the plasma membrane barrier. And also the second step to, to escape out of the endocytic tract into the cytosol as well as measured by some of the microRNA people. Um, so certainly, you know, it's, it's perfectly possible these are natural agents, and they're also um, covered in complement inhibitory molecules as well. So you presumably shouldn't get some of the horrible um, side effects that we've seen with some basic liposome formulations in the past. Um, there's so much we don't understand about these vesicles, how they interact with different cells, and how they're taken up. So. Throwing them into patients as drug delivery vehicles, I think, is a, a few years off yet, given the lack of knowledge in terms of cellular uptake and how we might control and manipulate that, as well as, of course, manipulating the cargo of the vesicles without harming the vesicles. Okay, and Hal, another question. What's the best strategy to isolate exosomes from plasma or serum? Um, what is the best plasma or serum, and how do you assay the purity of exosomes? It's a mouthful there. Well, this is a this is a million dollar question. Um, we don't know. I mean, we've tried um, for a long time um, over the last two years to develop a workable methodology for doing this, something that is not too clunky and too cumbersome to make it unworkable for clinical samples, but also it has to give a product that's fairly pure. Um, so we've we've kind of adopted this column chromatography based approach now. I'm not saying to you that this is the best method. Um, there may well be um, more effective methods that give you purer product. Um, we'll see what they turn out to be. But certainly for us, in our hands, um, the column is fairly quick. Um, it's not too cumbersome, and the product it gives us does indeed get rid of an awful lot of those high abundant plasma proteins that do confound and will completely interfere with a mass spec-based readout which is the best in terms of plasma or serum. I think the general consensus is for, for exosomes that plasma is better. 
I think the idea is that when you form a clot, you're losing a lot of your vesicles integrally as part of the clotting process. Um, and some people have estimated this loss to be uh, as much as 70% of the exosomes are down in the clot. Um, so if you're really up against it in, in terms of getting quantity, I think plasma is ideal. Of course, plasma is more complex than um, serum. So what you gain by doing one thing, you may lose in terms of the complexity of the sample. And the last point there is in terms of how do you assess the purity of the sample. Um, this is, again, a very tricky question, and people take different views on this. We have a very simple method, um, which is certainly flaws, where we measure the number of nanoparticles in a sample using something like the nanocyte platform, and we measure protein, and then we express it as a particle-to-protein ratio. And the higher that number is, the higher the purity is, with certain caveats, of course, because protein per exosome may change in different conditions, and particles are particles, they're not necessarily vesicles. Um, but as a rough and ready guide to purity, we found that approach very helpful. Um, when you're trying to assess purity, you need to look for material that you don't expect to be in your vesicle, and it's quite rare to see this done. So for our samples, we might look for albumin, for example, um, or certainly for the cell culture work, we would look for something like calnexin, or maybe nuclear proteins, and they should not really be present. And massive amounts of those proteins in your sample does indicate a relatively unclean exosome preparation. So I hope those those comments help to uh, address some of your questions there. Well, wow, it's a yearman response. Uh, maybe you want to take a breath because I have another question for you. Uh, do you ever use commercial exosome precipitation kits? If not, why not? If so, how do results compare with ultracentrifugation? There are, there are a lot of these um, reagents available at the moment, and it seems that there's more coming out every month. It's very difficult to compare head-by-head head all of these things um, with a standard, which is ultracentrifugation. In general, I think the field should be rather wary of what is basically a crude pull all kinds of things down into a pellet precipitation method. They can be quick. Um, and they can be very efficient in terms of protein pull-down at least, but they're not particularly vesicularly selective at the moment. I'm um, sure so as part of a workflow, I'm sure they have their use and their value, but simply to rely on, on a cheap and cheerful kit and expect that to give you uh, the, the shortcut that you're looking for in this field is probably doubtful. Um, there are also flaws to ultracentrifugation as well. I mean, that ha has a cost to it in terms of time and tubes. Um, and again, it pulls down non-vesicular material. So it's all, it's all a balance about time and effort spent in making the sample, assessing the purity and the quality of the sample that you have, and moving onward. Generally, in my lab, we tend to um, stay away from precipitation as a general rule, just because we have the ultracentrifugation kit here. Um, but I can see the value of precipitation as part of a workflow, maybe just as a concentration step, once you've cleaned away most of the contaminating proteins, for example. So I certainly wouldn't dismiss them. Thank you. And Steve, question for you. What's the advantage of somamer compared to antibody? How could you find the specific aptamer sequence for different antigens in a single cell? So um, in relation to antibodies, the, um, the way the assay works here, where we're mixing together a thousand reagents together, um, if you mix together a thousand antibodies, you basically get non-specific binding that, that you, and people have tried to multiplex antibodies um, and with some success. I mean, there are companies out there who batch you know, small groups of antibodies together. It's usually eight or 12 maximum. Um, beyond that, you start to run into um, non-specific binding where the antibody is, is binding to more than one protein. So that's been a kind of upper limit to antibodies, which you can overcome by batching uh, them into small groups of a dozen or so. But when you're trying to get up to a thousand or several thousand where our sites are set, you, batching small groups of eight or ten antibodies to reach that number would be pretty difficult. Another advantage of somomers is that they're completely synthetic, that once we've identified the sequence, we can keep on making that same sequence forever. Um, whereas, as you know, that once you've, um, once you've come up with an antibody, 
uh, you're dependent on uh, the expression system remaining the same, and that's um, often uh, a difficult problem. Regarding cells, um, what we've done with SOMASCAN today is to make, to make it measure the 1,129 proteins. Um, and we made those reagents, as I mentioned earlier, one at a time against the individual proteins. So when you're using that assay to measure proteins from a cell, you can do it from cell culture, you can do it from cell lysis or supernatants. So you can find out what proteins are inside the cell in the, way, in the same way as, um, as Ale described on, uh, for microsomes, using the assay as it is. Um, it's, it's also possible to do it the other way around where you can do this, the um, reagent selection process against a cell. So you're not actually, you don't know what proteins you're measuring. You're just trying to find reagents that bind cell surface. Um, and that's something that we have done, uh, some of for clients. It's, it's not routine. So if that's the kind of thing you want, then, uh, then talk to us. But um, I think those are the two ways that you would look at cells, either using the, the named reagents that you already know what they're measuring, um, or uh, selecting against the cell, but uh, not knowing uh, or having to do some more work to find out what it is those reagents you've found are actually binding to. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And Alan, what's the source of the exosomes that you analyzed? Oh, so for, so for the slides I presented, the first half of the talk was based on um, prostate cancer cell line called D145. So we grow these cells in a fairly high cell density way using integral bioreactor flasks. Um, and with weekly feeds, the supernatant that come off those flasks are already fairly concentrated in exosome vesicles. Um, so they were pre-concentrated, and then they went on the sucrose gradient method, which I showed you. Um, so D145 cell, I said, a cell, cell line was the source of the, uh, the first experiment. And for the, for the plasma and the, and the urine study at the end of the talk, it was just healthy donors from the lab. And Alid, uh, one person asks, how are the intravesicular proteins analyzed? Do you lyse the exosome completely, uh, which results in a pool of proteins in solution, or something else? Okay, so, so we really did scratch our heads over this one. Um, you certainly need to do something to deal with the structure of the vesicle to get some of us to access those intravesicular proteins. So we did play with different conditions um, in terms of lysing exosomes with detergents and so on. But what you have to consider is that the presence of these um, lytic conditions may also have an impact on the performance of the assay. So the assay has been validated very carefully by the guys at SOMASCAN under their set conditions. Um, so I would advise people to tinker with those conditions with care because although you may get access to the inside of the vesicle, you may also interfere perhaps with some, some of them as binding their targets in the presence of some reagents. Um, so do that, but do it with care. And there's certainly um, scope there for optimizing how we lie sexisms and make it compatible with the SOM assay, even better than what we've done already. I think there's some scope for that. It's very different, of course, from a mass spec approach, where you're in the extreme lytic denaturing kind of um, situation. Um, and certainly we found reagents like DTT to be very important in helping us rip open exosomes and solubilize proteins properly. But they were just simply too harsh for the SOMOLOGIC platform. So tinker with those, with those reagents um, with some care, I think, if you're going to use this assay. And Alid, someone asks, how did Dr. Clayton immobilize exosomes on the plate? All right, that, that's really very easy. So we buy in um, plates which are designed for you to make your own ELISA-type assays. So these are sticky plates. They, um, they're designed to bind to antibody. Um, you can buy these plates from multiple manufacturers and they have different protein binding capacity for each well. So we use just generally high protein binding wells. They think they bind around, um, I think it's 14 nanogram per well or something like that. And you just simply stick your purified exosome samples onto the well and leave them overnight and they bind. If your sample is fairly dirty and full of non-vesicular protein, that protein will equally bind. So you're only going to get reasonable signals 
on this platform if your sample that you're adding to the place is already very pure. And valid question from, what is the volume of the sample that you apply to the column? Oh, right. So that's, that's very easy. Typically, we do one to one and a half mil of, of plasma on the column. Um, we find any more, we get porous separation between the exosome peak and the non-exosomal peak. It gets more of a smear. Um, and from that kind of volume, we're getting enough material from the bottom end of the column to do a SOM assay and to do any of these um, sticky plate assays that I mentioned to help us qualify the column. So there's enough stuff coming from one and a half mils of plasma. Uh, thank you, Alan. And, and with that answer, we've come to the end of our webinar. Please note that the webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genangnews.com. If you miss parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to your colleagues and friends, which we highly recommend. Thanks again to the panel for their outstanding presentations, and I want to say thank you to our audience for your attention and your very thoughtful questions about various topics brought up during the webinar. And thank you to SomaLogic, whose support made this webinar possible. Bye for now.